Hey guys, here's a short video explaining why calculus does not solve Zeno's paradoxes. I'm not the first to point out these ideas, but I hadn't seen a really good resource anywhere that was concise and didn't involve calculus, so I wanted to lay out the basic concepts for you so everybody can understand them. So we'll start with a infinite series. So take the series 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 16th, and so on. You may have seen this series before. You may also see this part of the series where it says equals one, that this series equals one. Okay, the problem with a lot of math education is people don't seem to ask two really critical questions here. First of all, what do these little three dots mean? When we say, and so on, what does, exactly that mean. The, the, the normal intuition is something like, and the series continues off infinitely into the distance. The numbers just continue going on. There's no end to this series. Now, in this video, I'm not going to explain why that's a dubious concept. That's not the focus of this video, but it's worth asking, well, do numbers work that way? Can, can a, an infinite series continue off even if the series hasn't been constructed by anybody? Where does this series come from? But second question is more important, which is the focus of this video, which is to say, what does the equal sign mean? Okay, critically important, this is not something unique to me, but everybody needs to understand this. The equal sign in mathematics is a symbol that means different things in different contexts. So it doesn't always mean equals as in one plus one equals two. There's this perfect identity between the numbers on the left hand and the numbers on the right hand. But what is two? Well, it is the same thing as one plus one. In this context, when you're talking about summing an infinite series, the equal sign does not mean equality. It actually means something different. That's intentional. The concept that we're going to be talking about was come up with uh, uniquely to say this is not equals in the regular sense. Now, why they chose the equal sign, good heavens, I guess I understand because it's really practical. I won't go into the details of why it's really practical, but it causes all kinds of logical confusion as people seem to think that calculus solves Zeno's paradoxes and it doesn't. So another way you can describe this series, you could say the series converges to one. That's another word that has a very precise meaning. You could describe it as saying the series gets increasingly close to one as you add up a half and then a half of the previous term and a half of the previous term. So you go a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, and so on. The farther you go, the closer the sum will be to one increasingly close. You could also say that sum is getting arbitrarily close to one, as close as you like to one, while never fully reaching equality with one. Again, that's the point of the concept of convergence, is to say this is a non-identical relationship. It's different than normal addition. Getting extremely close to a thing is different than actually reaching a thing. Another way you can describe it, one can be understood as the limit of the series. This is going to, this is a concept that's central in calculus. We're not gonna dive into, but you can understand it this way as well. The one can be understood as the smallest value that the series never reaches. That's kind of an interesting way to think about the limit in this context. Um, as you add up this infinite series, and you get closer and closer and closer to one, you can kind of think of one as this end point that's actually kind of beyond the edge. You can't ever reach that point. It's the smallest amount that that series is never going to add up to. Another uh, word that's used to describe this is an asymptotic relationship, which I'll illustrate in a way that people will be able to grasp in just a second. Um, the point is that asymptotic relationships, this getting close to a value but never reaching a value, is explicitly logically distinct from uh, normal summation. So thinking that calculus solves Zeno's paradoxes is conflating the asymptotic relationship with an equality relationship. That is a, a logical and profound error 
And in fact, that right there is sufficient to say calculus doesn't solve Zeno's paradoxes. For that very reason, it's dealing with asymptotic relationships and not equalities. Okay, so let's, I'll, I'll give you a visual example so you can visually see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so this is a simple graph of a function. Don't be scared, everybody can understand this. Function is just a thing that turns inputs into outputs. Uh, and this is a graph of how it's turning those inputs into outputs. So the function is f of x equals one over x. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if you input one into the function, you will get out of the function one over one in this case. So we'll plot that there, one over x. So whatever x is, the function is outputting one over x. So if it's two, if we put two into the function, we get one over two. And you can see where the next uh, point is. Uh, if the input of the function is four, then the output of the function is one over four, and similarly with eight and so on. So this continues. Whatever number you put into the function, it outputs one over that number. <clears throat> you can understand this the following way. As x increases, f of x shrinks. Or as x increases, f of x tends to zero. That's another term that sounds like calculus. <clears throat> but it's pretty straightforward to understand, okay? The bigger the x, the smaller the one over x. And you can see that relationship graph there. Okay, so here's a question. Could there be a large enough x such that f of x equals zero? Doesn't approximate zero. We're gonna use equals in the strict logical sense. But there is an identity between f of x and zero. Another way to ask the question. At any point, does the line ever touch the x-axis? If you look at that graph, it goes way out to the right, right? You can imagine we're inputting 100 trillion, trillion, trillion into the function, and what comes out is one, 100, one, one trillion, trillion, trillionth, right? Just tight, which is going to be so close to the x-axis as to be practically there for um, useful purposes, but it's still logically not touched. So the question is, at any point, as far along as you go on that axis, does that line ever actually touch the x-axis? The answer is no. It kind of makes sense. It doesn't matter how big a number you plug into that function, you're always going to have one over whatever the number is. And that's an, another way of saying that is you're always gonna have some amount left over regardless of how big that underlying number is. Okay, so let's port this back to Zeno's paradox. So with Zeno, let's, so you see the graph here, let's consider the point on the far left of the line zero and then the point on the far right of the line, line one. So that's the totality of, of the distance that has to be covered. So our runner, before going from zero to one, he has to cover half of that distance in Zeno's paradoxes. Okay, so he has to go half. And then from that halfway point, to the number one, he has to go half of that distance, which would be a half of a half, which is a quarter. And then from that point, he still has half the distance remaining, so he has to go an eighth of the distance, then he has to go a sixteenth of the distance, then he has to go a thirty-second of the distance, and so on. So, the, so according to Zeno, if space is infinitely divisible, then you have a never-ending series of half points that the person has to cross. He can never complete all of them, and so he concluded motion is impossible. We don't have to conclude motion is impossible, though the logic of his argument is actually good. So this looks very similar to what we just saw, a half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus a sixteenth, dot, dot, dot. And then we're at, we want to know, okay, how could this series ever equal one? Zeno isn't asking how could the runner get arbitrarily close to one. He's not saying how could the runner get ever so ar a fraction of a fraction of a fraction so close to the finish line. He wants to know how could he complete the race? How could he get across the finish line? Uh, yes, yeah, so you can describe it as getting increasingly close to one. Another way of putting this is at every point, according to Zeno, and this way of thinking, there is always an infinite number of points remaining. So wherever he is in that race, if he's at the halfway point, the quarter point, the 16th, whatever it is, 
there is always not just additional points remaining, but an infinite number of points remaining. How the hell does that work? So even if he's a one one trillionth of the way to getting to that final destination, if space is infinitely divisible, then, well, he's still got a, a myriad of infinities to cross. And in fact, there's an even further logical problem, was, which is how does he even get to the halfway point in the first place? Because even to go from zero to the halfway point means you have to cross a halfway point in the first place. So you have, before going a halfway, you got to go a quarter, and you got to go an eighth, and you got to go a sixteenth. So you have infinities in both directions that are all nested in front, uh, inside of each other, which is a problem. If you follow that logic, just like the line will never meet the x-axis and the series will never literally equal one, the runner will never reach the end of this infinite series. He's never going to reach an end of crossing all of the points. So this is valid reasoning. And if you follow along with the intuition of the first two parts, you'll see, yeah, that actually makes sense. If there's an infinite amount of points between here and there, at every point, there's always going to be an infinite more. He couldn't make progress. Yes, of course, these values never, these values converge, but they never actually reach equality. Well, what does that mean? Does, do we conclude with Zeno that motion is impossible? No, we don't. There's actually a really simple, concrete, logical resolution to Zeno's paradoxes. Space is not infinitely divisible. One of the premises of this whole idea is that between any two points, there is, an, there is a third point. There's a middle point. There's a halfway point. Well, if space isn't infinitely divisible, that's not true. There's at some point along that series, you get to the point that's right, adjacent, right next to the end point. There's no middle point between them. The best analogy is to pixels on your computer screen. Between two pixels, there isn't a middle pixel. It's a pixel side by side to another pixel. That's fine. That actually solves all of Zeno's paradoxes. All we need is space to be discrete. And it's no more complex than that. For a long period of time, people thought space couldn't be discrete because of this reason or that reason, and math would break, and it's impossible. All of those turned out to be wrong. We've seen in the 20 and the 21st century, discrete mathematics is superior, in my opinion, to uh, continuous mathematics. We have the math of discrete space. It's not a big deal. This is clearly the simplest resolution. We don't have to have nested infinities inside of infinities. Everything is clear, logical, and precise. Again, I'm not the first person to point this out. There have been plenty of people beforehand, but based on my conversations with various individuals, it seems clear that the, uh, the math education that they're receiving blurs the line between asymptotic relationships and equalities, which is just a travesty, and hopefully this video will help clear that up once and for all.